Hi, this is Norm, KC9 CSC. I'm holding a large velour bag. And inside this bag is not a giant bottle of Crown Royal. Instead, it's a clock. It turns out, the face of this clock has an interesting history that is intrinsically tied to radio. The XYL gave me this last month as an anniversary gift. She knew that I'd been looking for a nice wall clock to hang in the shack. She searched the web for radio clock and found this. It turns out this is a ship's radio room clock. Similar clocks can be found hanging in radio rooms on ships for almost 100 years. This radio room clock I have here is made by the Chelsea Clock Company in Chelsea, Massachusetts. I'll post a review of this clock in another video. I previously knew nothing about ship's radio room clocks and I had a number of questions when I first saw this. What's going on with these red and green sectors? What are these red dashes around the outside of the face? And what does all this have to do with ships? Looking up the answer to these questions led me down an interesting rabbit hole that I would like to share with you today. This story goes all the way back to the Third International Radio Telegraph Convention, which met in London, England in 1912. Representatives from 45 countries convened to update the International Maritime Radio Communication Standards, which were previously approved by the International Radio Telegraph Convention held in Berlin in 1906. Disaster struck the sea less than two months before the conference. On April 14, 1912, the RMS Titanic hit an iceberg. Two hours and 40 minutes later, the world's largest ocean liner sank into the freezing waters, resulting in the deaths of over 1,500 crew and passengers. After the Titanic sinking, safety communications at sea immediately became a very important factor in the deliberations of the Third International Radio Telegraph Convention. Regulations resulting from this conference required vessels equipped with shipboard radio stations to be able to transmit and receive at wavelengths of 600 meters and 300 meters. Smaller vessels unable to carry an antenna long enough to transmit on 600 meters could be authorized to transmit only on 300 meters. However, they still had to have the ability to receive on 600 meters. In order to increase the safety of life at sea, all ships were required to have an operator listening during the first 10 minutes of each hour. 600 meters was used as both a calling and distress frequency, and that channel could get very crowded, especially in their busy shipping lanes. Regular traffic on this frequency could easily drown out any distress signals in the background. The next convention was not held for another 15 years when the 4th International Radio Telegraph Convention met in Washington, D.C. in 1927. This conference resulted in regulations mandating a silence period on 600 meters for the first 3 minutes at the 15th minute and at the 45th minute of each hour. The red sectors on the ship's radio room clock represent these silent periods and serve as a reminder to the ship's radio room operator that they should cease transmission on 600 meters during this time and monitor frequency for emergency calls. Early radio room clocks only had sectors at the 15 and 45 minute marks, so what about these green sectors? The International Telecommunication Convention convened in Atlantic City in 1947. This conference mandated 3 minute watches on 2.182 MHz at the top and bottom of each hour for the ships operating on this frequency. These green sectors on the clock represent this silent period on 2.182 MHz. So what about these red dashes around the outside of the clock face? Well, the 1947 International Radio Conference also issued the following recommendation. Hi YouTube, this is Greg from Shacking Off. And I just wanted to read a part of the recommendations number six from the 1947 International Radio Conference. D, in order that the keeping of this watch may be as economical as possible, it is desirable to envisage the possibility of employing automatic devices for this purpose and the further that these may be combined with automatic calling devices. E, that in such devices are employed, the international warning signal will be required of which the signal described in 879 of the radio regu regulations may be a part. Invites the International Radio Consultative Committee to study the possibility of ensuring that which that the watch of the frequencies 2,182 kilocycles per second may be aid of automatic devices, and if a practical solution is found, to make the necessary recommendations. I'm not an actual international maritime law expert, so don't make that mistake. Now back to the show. It didn't take long before automatic watchkeeping devices and alarms were developed. Early auto alarms used electrical mechanical relay memory to keep track of incoming CW signals. When a ship was in distress, the first thing the operator sent was 12 4-second long DAWs with a 1-second break in between each DAW. 
These 12 4-second dots were often transmitted by an automatic sending device. In the event a distressed ship did not have such a device, or it malfunctioned, the 12 dashes around the outside of the clock face enabled the operator to accurately time his call. Interesting enough, the distress call was required by regulations to be sent in A2 modulation. A2 modulation is CW transmitted using an audio tone to modulate a carrier wave. Upon receipt of four consecutive four-second DAWs, an auto alarm was triggered, ringing bells in the radio room, the bridge, and the radio operator's cabin of any ship that received the signal. The radio operator of the receiving signal would then monitor the radio for any additional information coming from the distressed ship. The YL's Radio League District 6 has a YouTube video with an in-depth tour of the radio room aboard the SS Red Oak Victory in Richmond, California. This video has a great demonstration of a ship's auto alarm system. I posted a link to the video in the show description if you are interested in how these early systems worked. Hi YouTube, this is Greg from Shacking Off, and I just wanted to let you know that per FCC Part 97, Section 305, Paragraph C, A2 modulation is not allowed on the amateur radio bands below 6 meters, so don't make that mistake. Now back to the show. In 1979, a group of experts drafted the International Convention on Maritime Search and Rescue, which called for a global search and rescue plan. This led to the development of the Global Maritime Distress and Safety System, or GMDSS. This new system is based on a combination of satellite and terrestrial radio services, and changed distress communications from being primarily ship-to-ship -ship based to ship-to-shore based. This system eventually spelled the end of Morse code operations on commercial ships. By the late 1990s, 500 kilohertz was no longer monitored for distress signals worldwide. On August 1, 2013, the U.S. Coast Guard stopped monitoring 2.182 megahertz. The Coast Guard still maintains a continuous watch on VHF Marine FM channels 16 and the 4, 6, 8, and 12 megahertz marine bands. If there is an open band in the spectrum, you can be rest assured that there are hams who are willing to play around in that space. In 2006, the FCC's Office of Engineering Technology granted a Part 5 experimental license, WD2XSH, to the ARL on behalf of a group of hams interested in investigating the spectrum around 500 kHz. They received permission to experiment and do research between 505 and 510 kHz at power levels of up to 20 watts effective radiated power using narrowband modes CW and PSK31. Further proposals to allocate frequencies near 500 kHz resulted in the creation of the 630-meter amateur radio band that we enjoy today. With the timekeeping abilities of the modern Hamshack computer, an analog wall clock may seem a bit redundant. However, there is something to be said about being able to quickly glance up and find the time with the simplicity of an old-fashioned analog shack clock. And that's it. Thanks for watching.